fun and a special privilege to be here for me today. Uh, I've known Melissa from before she knew herself, she was a little baby, because Ron Caston was one of my oldest friends since we were about 11 years old. In fact, uh, he, even at that stage of my life, I remember calling him Pop. He was only two years older and he was sort of showing leadership at that stage. And Ron was an inspiration for much of my career and I would imagine would be smiling if there ever was an afterlife at the subject matter of my talk today, which is the suggestion um, previously probably thought to be absurd that the Constitution may have acquired a few jet engines. Um, I do want to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations and the Wurundjeri people, um, the traditional owners of the land we're on. It, it um, is interesting for me to do so. I, I usually accompany that acknowledgement with an additional acknowledgement that, that we're also on the lands that were stolen from them, the lands taken in breach of international law. But that's not the point of the mention. The real point of the mention, apart from the acknowledgement, is that today I want to talk about this constitution, which is probably about the dreariest document you could possibly read. Um, it was put together by the founding fathers, as they're so humbly called, who were a pretty dull bunch of people. The mention, the mention to any of them that we might have a Bill of Rights of the kind the United State, States had was absolutely abhorrent, so therefore you can read this document and not really find a scary of a mention of anything like a human right. There is a right to a jury trial, which wasn't bad, but not much else. And it's a document that basically set up the federal government with the federal parliament to be democratically elected, a federal judiciary and a federal executive. But essentially it was about the sharing of power between state and federal governments with the state governments expected to have majority of that power, but that didn't transpire. But 110 years later, this document has had a remarkable life. Um, it has adapted to political, social and economic change in ways that I don't think anyone really anticipated, and actually not many today even appreciate. And I just briefly want to talk about that aspect in the human rights context. Particularly over the last 20 years, uh, entirely through the activities of the High Court, the Constitution has become quite highly protective of human rights against the exercise of arbitrary, capricious or unsupervised legislative or executive power. And while I personally have long lamented the absence of the Bill of Rights in Australia and don't in any way wish to speak against one, what the Constitution is rapidly teaching those who want to come to terms with it is that the embedded cult constitutional culture of life, rights have become more justiciable in the courts than previously thought and in many ways offer far greater protections than any statutory Bill of Rights might even get near offering. And that's quite a significant statement. And I just want to make it good in a few areas. It's late, so I'll, I'll try, try to be quite brief. But the main area that had evolved over the last 50, 60 years was the separation of powers. But that mainly evolved with having the courts administer the law, the parliament make it. The, uh, sorry, the courts adjudicate on the law, the parliaments make it, the executive and minister, and the courts kept each within their respective spheres with an override to declare laws unconstitutional. But the separation of powers, in fact, is developed into the most fundamental protection of the individual in this country that exists. The court stands between that individual and the abuse or misuse of executive power. And it's become a real bulwark and recent decisions of the High Court have struck down every endeavour by Parliament to try and immunise executive power from judicial challenge. So when they tried to immunise the Court's challenges to decisions under the Migration Act, with what was called the Most Noise and Primitive Clause, which says that the decisions final and binding are not reviewable in the Courts, the High Court had no difficulty in saying 
the primitive cause power was beyond Parliament if it was to exclude the right of the court to say your conduct as a member of the executive is unlawful or without statutory warrant or justification. Now, then the next dramatic turn came in a case that was called a case called S157. The next dramatic turn came in a case a few years ago where the court has extended these doctrines of having all executive power subject to judicial supervision to the state system as well. It was always thought this was a federal quirk and that the separation of powers was a federal matter, but what's happened in decisions such as Cable and Kirkham, there was one recently, just the other day, that reaffirmed these decisions, is that the state's part of the federation and they are a repository of federal judicial power, and in other words, part of the total compact that exercises judicial power throughout the country, and the state courts cannot be constructed to perform roles that are unsuitable for federal courts. Now, it hasn't gone the whole hog as making the state courts exactly the same as the federal courts, but basically, state parliaments cannot confer powers on state judges that are incompatible with their role as judicial officers administering federal law. Now, that's quite a nice legal quirk, but the effect of it, and that's what I'm really interested in, not so much the jurisprudential basis for it, the effect of it, is that there is no decision in this country by any member of the executive that is immune from legal challenge on the ground of being unlawful, arbitrary or capricious. That's a big statement because Mr Ash's executive officers who were doing all the things he described before under the immigration laws, apart from a few who may be in the private detention system, every one of them are executive officers. The police, ASIO, ASIO, everyone who can exercise any power in this country, any public power, is an executive officer. So to say that they are entirely subject to being kept within their power by the courts <coughs> under this very strong constitutional foundation that can't be tampered with by Parliament is one of the most important foundations that have emerged over the last 10, 15 years in our constitution. So when I can go to cases like the migration cases, we had two, M61 and M71. The first one, M61, said that the government's excision of parts of Australia from Australia, if you think about it, an absurd concept, did not work legally. Why? Because the executive had to have power to detain people to remove them from one part of Australia to an excised part of Australia, and constitutionally, these excisions don't work because Australia is what it is. The government can't carve out somewhere and say, this is outside our legal, <coughs> the court's legal ambit. So that meant, again with great irony, that all the offshore processing which was set up to be outside the judicial review process became more protected by judicial review than the onshore processing where certain limitations have been imposed, which are awful. So all the offshore processing, all these people who are arriving in Christmas Island now, have got better constitutional rights than the ones who are onshore because they're not covered by the Migration Act. Their protection is under the Constitution. So any unlawful decision, any denial of natural justice, any error of law that amounts to jurisdictional error is a right that all offshore um, applicants for asylum have. The M61 case, the Malaysian solution case, again, as a judgment in the High Court, it's a very dry judgment. The topic of law and the issue of law, which I don't want to bore you with, is whether the actual agreement fell within the four corners of the Migration Act. But the underlying principle, which is much more interesting, is it's yet another example of the executive government going off to Malaysia, coming up with a people swap, which they can do, coming up with a so-called international agreement which says it's not an enforceable agreement and delivering it up to the High Court and saying this gives us power to forcibly remove people in Australia without legislative authority to do so. And the High Court then looked at the very close parameters of the Migration Act and said, no, this agreement, which is not an agreement, doesn't give the protections that Parliament has said are to be built in and therefore is unlawful. Therefore, you don't have the executive power to remove. 
Now, the politicians screamed and yelled like the High Court had ratted on the system of law we have, which again doesn't say much for the intellectual level at which they understand these issues. <laughs> but more importantly, it's yet another example of the court standing between a powerless, voiceless individual, because we don't even give them names, they're called MXYZ or something like that, and the power of the state, and it is very, very effective. Now, that's what I call Chapter 3, the supremacy of the judicial power to supervise the legality of all public power in the country. There's a, a section in itself under the Constitution which gives the High Court power to issue ancient writs, which has become the cornerstone of all the power of judicial review, which the Parliament cannot take away from the federal court system, which is the right to challenge these decisions. Is it activism? It's funny enough, no one uses those terms, but yet when we had the uh, representative government cases of the Mason Court, everyone was yelling activism. There's no words of separation of powers. There's nothing in the Constitution that says these obscure prerogative writs are immune from any dabbling with by the Parliament. But the High Court has found these are constitutional protections and they're highly well-established and unlikely um, to be changed. Now, I wanted to just focus a little more on how wide and important this protection is. Um, Lord Helsham, in a fairly famous lecture in 1976, in the Dimbledon Lecture, talked about how the powers of government have now come to ultimately reside in executive power. Not really well appreciated and understood in our society, even 35 years later. What he said is the powers of government within Parliament are now largely in the hands of the government machine so that the government controls Parliament and not Parliament the government. He concluded we live under an elective dictatorship, absolute in theory, if hitherto thought tolerable in practice. <coughs> Alan's previous talk, which I'm sure could produce no surprises for anyone, shows how far that so-called elective dictatorship can work in practice. Children overboard in Tampa, people self-harming, suiciding, nameless, no one given access to them. That's the ultimate example of the kind of power that Lord Helsham was talking about. Now, <clears throat> it's quite interesting, just on this executive, <coughs> sorry, this executive power, that the High Court handed down another decision in the last couple of weeks on the chaplains, the power of the federal government to fund chaplains. Sounds a bit like a human rights issue, chaplains in school, religion, etc., but it wasn't. What had happened in the chaplain's case is yet another and very, very powerful step by the High Court to limit the power of the executive government in this country. What happens is they Parliament passes appropriation bills. Dozens, hundreds of pages of spending items and the chaplains and all item number 156 underneath it was autistic kids. And so all the government programs changing the lights on the battleship, every appropriation was stuck in these appropriation bills which Parliament thought it had the power to pass and therefore make it a law of the Commonwealth, therefore spending was for the purpose of the Commonwealth. What troubled the High Court about this is that appropriation bills can't be amended in the Senate. They either have to be passed or rejected. So the effect of this process of appropriation bills being able to have the whole services of government up to non-services such as the chaplaincy service and a lot of other non-services able to be passed through Parliament, the lower house, with the government in control, with the executive in control of the government for things like appropriation. That bypassed the Senate's supervising role, an element of checks and balances built into the Constitution. They didn't say this was the reason it was unconstitutional, but the real underlying principle for keeping executive power within the parliamentary powers of the Commonwealth is that the appropriation system as a law of Parliament bypassed the Senate supervisory power and the Senate was part of the constitutional democratic check and balance that was built into our system. Ironically, it's got nothing to do with state rights, which is why it was there in 1901, but if you try and ask in 2012, 
why something was put in in 1931 and you're just burying yourself in a, a sand hole. The real point is that the Senate has now become one of the most important checks and balances in our constitution against the, exec the exercise of arbitrary parliamentary or constitutional, unconstitutional power. So that was just another interesting example of how this constitutional protection in areas not really hitherto thought of have produced fundamental change. The effect of the Williams case is if Parliament wants to have a legislative program that involves spending of money, it enacts legislation in power, and it appropriates money to give effect to the legislative scheme. If it's going to be administrative services of government, such as changing the light globes on a battleship, then it can do so through appropriation because that's part of the annual services of government. But new programs like the chaplaincy program have got nothing much to do with the annual services of government. It was under that kind of umbrella that the sort to be relied on. So that's the protection you get through executive misuse of power. The other area that's been very dramatic is representative democracy and free speech. Um, it's, it's quite fascinating that this has evolved in two ways. We know that in the 90s we had the ACTV case and the found an implication of an implied freedom of constitutional, uh, in constitutionally protected, an implied freedom of political and government speech. The simple underlying principle was if you're going to have an election, then you have to have an informed vote. If you have to have an informed vote, you have to have an informed debate. If you have an informed debate, you have to have a political discussion. And you can't have the government regulate what can and can't be discussed. That evolved and has now become very much embedded in our constitutional protection. So without a freedom of speech, Bill of Rights Charter, which could be regulated at the time by Parliament, without a First Amendment of the kind the United States has, we actually have quite a fundamentally embedded protection of freedom of political and government communication, which includes protest in the Constitution, subject to certain reasonable limitations, but apart from the First Amendment, which has been a bit of a wild horse in its own right in the United States, very few democracies have unimpeded or unimpeded freedom of speech. But what was really interesting is the High Court's extension of the free speech doctrine in two cases um, as a result of the Howard government's untrammeled control of both houses of parliament. What the government did is pass two electoral laws, not much debate, no report, and no one knew much about it. The first was to prevent prisoners from voting if they were in prison on the day of the election. It's pretty odd because we're a convict state, so that uh, <laughs> even back in 1901 when we put this awful document together, we still said that if you're in jail for less than 12 months under a sentence, uh, for a crime that was subject to a sentence of imprisonment of less than 12 months, you could stay and serve as a member of parliament in jail. <laughs> so that was 1901. So in fact, it was the most draconian exclusion from electoral voting that we'd seen even pre-1901 and post-1901. That was challenged by uh, an Indigenous woman, Vicky Roach, who was at Danforth's Frost Prison. And the challenge was that there was an implied limitation on Parliament's power to restrict the right of a citizen to vote. It had to be based on some rational basis connected with the purpose of electoral democracy, such as an informed vote, so a person who may be mentally impaired might have their voting rights restricted. The court found people who were up on serious sentences for serious crimes broken the social compact and may have their voting rights restricted. But Vicky won the case, and the important part is not really just that prisoners had the right to vote, although that was fairly significant, but it really was that Parliament couldn't tamper with the right to vote. And that's not bad, because back in 1901, uh, black fellows were not only not counted in the Constitution, they even formed part of the indissoluble people of the Commonwealth who formed the Commonwealth. Uh, met, most states excluded women from the franchise. Many states and places had property rights. So to come to a stage of having what in effect is a constitutionally protected universal franchise, it's quite a big step, and in many ways puts Australia far, far ahead of the American democratic protest, which can exclude felons from voting, but even after they've left jail, and it's a state rather than a federal matter for the most part. So some of these protections are quite 
strong and in fact often go much further than charter countries and many others. The other aspect of the uh, Howard Laws which were very interesting is they decided that young people were irresponsible if they didn't enrol as the first thing they did when they turned 18. I'm not sure which genius thought that that was on everyone's mind at that stage, but they decided to punish them and they say that if the uh, election's called and the writs are issued, the roll's pretty well closed straight away. Uh, it was a, an absurd law because the Electoral Commission itself had been saying that the best time for getting enrolments is the minute the election was called, that's when people start actually wanting to enrol. So it actually cut that period short is to almost disenfranchise a large number of people. Anyway, you know, two young students came forward and fought the case against the closure laws and won. And uh, it was certainly my exposure to the Twitter or the modern Facebook revolution. These students and the people behind them, which included GetUp, in the space of three or four days had managed to get 100,000 people to enrol between the date that Howard's roles closed and the date they would have closed but for his legislation. And any, as a result of the court saying that again this was another arbitrary restriction that wasn't justifiable on the electoral system, uh, case one and all those people got the right to vote and for better or for worse, which I can put in capital letters, it probably got Gillard in. Um, but there's also been some big cultural change as a result of the representative democracy free speech cases. And I want to talk about the Bolt case, but the Bolt legislation, which is about racial vilification, has been constructed very much with the implied freedom in mind, so that even where you've got laws outlawing racial vilification, which people can argue about on the right or wrong side of free speech, there is an exception built in, which is a constitutionally required exception that uh, bona fide speech or reasonable speech on a matter of public interest um, will not constitute racial vilification even if otherwise it qualified. And you'll find that kind of protection has been built into a number of laws to ensure that the laws themselves are compliant. And at the moment, going through the courts, are a number of cases on the limit of public power, whether it be Melbourne City Council or state or federal power, to limit protests, so the Occupy Melbourne case threw up a whole raft of constitutional issues. To what extent would people who can only protest in public be restricted or have to get a government permit to protest? Does that breach the implied constitutional freedom? That's working through the courts, but even the Melbourne City Council managed in its own peculiar way to slip into one of its bylaws something that allowed handbills that contain political protests to be able to be distributed without a permit. But if the kids wanted to have a birthday party in the Treasury Gardens and have a little flag slack celebrating kids' rights, they'd be acting unlawfully on the, on the council's view. So that gives you a broad picture.